morning. So um, I'm going to begin with some announcements and also going to uh, introduce you to Reverend Ken Reeves in a few minutes. So I'm going to start there. So um, I have to, there's some announcements for this week. And um, I want to begin with, if, if you have not completed the Quest survey online or hard copy, there are hard, hard copies out by uh, the welcoming desk. And it, it'll only take you a few minutes to fill this out. And it says, let your pre preferences be known. Uh, thank you. And now we have a couple things going on. And, Next week, or this week actually, this one is. First of all, I wanted to remind you that the Soulful Sundown is this Friday, and uh, the Reverend Jennifer Brower will be there. So she's just going to come back for this one. We won't see her after that, for, you know, until her sabbatical. But I just want to let you know that uh, she's going to be there. So, and then some. Uh, on Saturday, September 16th, at the UU Fellowship of Stony Brook, we have a day that's dealing with very various aspects of congregational life will take place. And there is right now, there is a, the van is going to be driven by a, um, I can't think of his name. It's a Latif, who is it? Oh, that's right, thank you, Colin Woodhouse. So, and um, you can sign up over there at the welcome desk for that as well. And the, 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 oh, I'm not sure if I said the time, but the time is 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., but you need to be here if you're gonna be taking the uh, van, you need to be here by 8.15 a.m. And I just wanted to put in a, I went to this last year, it was held here and it was excellent, so. If anyone wants to, you know, I really encourage you to come to this. Then uh, one more thing. Ask, um, there is a trip to the New York Botanical Gardens and the Chu, Chu, Chili, how do you say that, Ben? Chu Lily? Chil, Chihuly exhibit, Chihuly. I'll, I'll get it now. <laughs> And that's on the Thursday, September 14th. You leave um, here at 10 a.m., but cars and drivers are needed. And there's also, uh, Ben has a sign up for that on, on the welcoming desk. So now, on behalf of my fellow members and the minister of our congregation, it's, it's much pleasure to welcome you today to the Uni Unitarian Universal congregation at Shelter Rock. As a, as a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we believe in the spirit of life, called by many names. It's known to each of us uniquely. As people of the Unitarian Universal tradition, our task is encourage um, one another in our individual transformation so that we may help what is good in this world grow and, and thrive. And I'd like to introduce the doc, Reverend Dr. Ken Reeves. He's a graduate of Star King School for the Ministry and has served congregations in Ohio and Delaware. He has also earned a master's in pastoral counseling and a PhD in clinical psychology. He is currently a clinical psychology with a therapy practice and a consulting psychologist with the Center for Career Development and Ministry. And if you don't know this yet, he's also the son of Ruth Reeves. And this is a welcome back to, to uh, Reverend Reeves, because he also grew up in this parish, which we, would be natural since his mother belongs to our congregation. So, welcome, Dr. Reeves. Now, I'd like to ask you to. What do we have? Oh, I'm behind you. Okay. 
We have, oh, okay, so now we would like for each of you to greet each other. <laughs> Peace be in your hearts, through the energy of freedom and the warmth of love, may you live the fullness of being alive, and in that fullness find peace. Through justice and understanding, may humanity be at peace, and may all of life on earth live together in balance and peace. Thank you, Robin. And good morning, it's good to be with you all this morning. This seems like an, a tradition every year. I come and preach a sermon in the summer. It's a lovely tradition. I'm so glad to be back. I was worried that after last year's service, the tradition might be altered because the, pre the sermon I preached last year was entitled, I'm Running for President. 
and it didn't work out the way I had hoped. So uh, given that, that crash and burn, I think the worship committee took a lot of risk in inviting me back. <laughs> and to preach a sermon on being happy and having meaning in your life. If this one crashes and burns, I will be sorry. <laughs> Welcome to all you all. To you all. I, if there are anyone who is visiting here for the first time, I extend my welcome to you and applaud your courage. I think it takes some courage to enter the doors of an unfamiliar congregation, and so, welcome. And if I were to introduce this congregation to our visitors, I would say that like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, this is a support community for people on various journeys towards ultimate goals, such as truth, or love, or peace. And one of the ways we support each other is by reflecting you can gather and have a chance to reflect on our lives, sort of rise out of the weeds of our daily business and consider loftier matters, such as values, or purpose, or morality, or ethics. In fact, today's service reflects on happiness and meaning. And as we reflect on life, as we reflect on matters, that supports our slow maturation and journey. I think all around the world, religious people and non-religious people are all reflecting on such important matters. And I think what makes our reflections in the Unitarian Universalist context a little bit unique is that we might come to our reflections with a little bit of more openness. And this openness is reflected in our not having a creed. So if you went to a, maybe a Christian church and heard a sermon on happiness and meaning, the answer might be, well, here's our creed. If you believe this, you'll have happiness and meaning. We don't have such a creed, and so we might at times be a little bit more lost and confused on our exploration, but we might find answers that really fit, and our answers might be revelatory. And so I offer this service on happiness and meaning out of my caring for you and my desire to support you on your journeys. I hope that as you journey, you find answers that support you in living the fullness of being alive. One of the ways to have happiness is to appreciate the ordinary, daily events such as a morning. And that's what today's first hymn reflects. Morning has broken. Let's sing together. <laughs>
In silence, we may reflect quietly, unimpeded by other voices, but in the sanctuary supported by our caring presence of each other. Let us take, take this time for silence. Amen. May we rise for the words of affirmation in your order of service. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, today's op offering will go to the joint UUA-UUA 
USC Hurricane Harvey Recovery Fund. Half of all the funds raised will go to at-risk populations served by UUSC partners, and half of the funds will support UU congregations and members of those congregations most affected by the storm. Checks may be made out to UUA slash UUSC Hurricane Harvey Recovery Fund or to UUCSR with Hurricane Harvey Recovery Fund in the memo line. I have three readings that relate to happiness. The first is from Epictetus. People are disturbed not by things, but by the view which they take of them. And then Ralph Waldo Emerson. Crossing a bare common at twilight under a clouded sky without having in my thoughts any occurrence of a special good fortune, I have enjoyed perfect exhilaration. I am glad to the brink of fear. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see all, the currents of universal being circulate through me, I am part or parcel of God. And from Rebecca Parker. There is a love holding me, there is a love holding you, there is a love holding all, I rest in this love. And now we invite you to come up and light a candle for who, you know, somebody you would like to do that for. So please come up.
Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Nelson. That was great. Warms my heart. Well, this is a sermon about happiness and meaning and spirituality support for both. A sermon like this begs for an anecdote. When you think of happiness and meaning, I hope you have many stories. My story, one of many, as a kid, I went to a camp. Back in the Berkshires, the lake, the woods, the other kids, the counselors, all made for great summers. I grew from camper to leader in training to counselor to an administrator. After that, my summers filled with adulthood. But some of us Beckett alums conjured the idea of bicycling across Massachusetts, I live in Massachusetts, bicycling across Massachusetts to the camp as a fundraiser and for fun and because we're crazy. And that sounded great. I unearthed my bike, idle for a decade, dusted off the cobwebs, pumped up the tires, and joined the ride. For seven years now, we 20 or 30 grain guys have biked to Beckett. We cover 130 miles, climb prodigious hills, and at the end of the ride, we pedal into camp greeted by 250 cheering, singing, high-fiving kids. We are elated to have covered the distance, we are back in a place we love, and we are cheered like rock stars. After that, we swing down to the lake, sweaty and gritty from the road, and jump in. That's happiness. I'm guessing you won't be riding with us to Beckett next summer. You can if you want, but if, you, if you're not, I'm sorry, it's too bad. So, how could you too be happy and find meaning? Happiness comes via two ways, through helpful thoughts and when our needs are met. Regarding thoughts, to be happy, one views oneself and the world through a lens that is favorable. It is less the event that makes us happy, but the way the event is interpreted, or the lens through which we look at the event. Epictetus realized this when he stated, people are disturbed not by things, but by the view which they take of them. I can choose my lens. Through one lens, the world looks lousy, people are mean, I am hopelessly inadequate, stuck in a handbasket, convinced of my destination. Through another lens, the same facts, but the world is okay, people are doing the best they can, I'm okay and lovable, problems are temporary and I can take action to make things better. Here's an example. There are three masons at work. When asked what he is doing, the first sourly replies, I'm stacking bricks. The second, I'm building a wall. But the third beams as he replies, I am building a cathedral. Through one lens, life looks mundane. Through another, grand. This perspective does not come easy. Indeed, it defies common sense. Common sense says, event bad, feel bad. Event good, feel good. The perspective I'm offering says, event neutral, thoughts influence feelings. I'm not dependent on events. This perspective is easy when something you enjoy is happening like hundreds of boys cheering you. It is harder when something, with something difficult. For example, losing a job, one can think, I'm doomed, or this opens new possibilities. With a truly sad event, like the loss of a loved one, one might actually constructively think, this is terrible. I love someone and now they are gone, Right now, all is lost. I miss my loved one, and I have a right to feel bad. Pain and love are intertwined. 
I would not feel so sad had I not loved. I will mourn and heal. I may not be happy, but I do not have to feel bad for feeling bad. Even when the world is bleak and tragic, I can follow the example of Viktor Frankl, who survived a Nazi concentration camp in part by living by helpful thoughts, his values, and his principles. Not in a concentration camp, but toiling up a hill on my bicycle, I can think, who put this hill here? It keeps going up. This is wrong. My legs are tired. Everyone else is happily relaxing at the top. Grumble, grumble. Or I can think, I'll get there. Hard is good. This is not a race. I am getting closer to my goal, and I'm earning a wild ride downhill. The second way to be happy involves meeting needs. When our needs are met, we're happy. Most fundamentally, people need, of course, food, clothing, and shelter. After that, people need health, love, safety, freedom, achievement, transcendence. Needs differ from wants. You can see this as happiness rises along alongside people's movement out of poverty. That movement meets their needs. But then it plateaus, happiness plateaus, even if wealth continues to rise. Moving out of poverty meets needs, but after needs are met, oh darn, more happiness does not pour out of gold-plated faucets. While each of us controls the thoughts we entertain, allowing us to generate happiness by ourselves, meeting needs is complicated by other people who have their needs, the rascals. <laughs> Unfortunately, the rest of the world is not poised and waiting to meet my needs. Indeed, someone else's needs will conflict with mine, which is just outrageous. Meeting needs being complicated and difficult, people sometimes give up meeting them. They might believe they do not have the right to have their needs met. They might doubt someone would care to meet them. They might not even know what their needs are. A subordinate and a dominant subordinate relationship would assume their needs will go unmet, not assert them, I mean, why bother? And of course, the unasserted needs do go unmet, and the individual is unhappy. Those unmet needs still clamor for attention, though. I mean, if one had not eaten, hunger would gnaw. Unmet needs leave one depressed, anxious, or resentful. And those unmet needs might gain expression in indirect ways. Silent martyrdom, complaint, sarcasm, and furious explosions from time to time. When unmet needs are expressed indirectly, they are difficult for someone else to meet. It is as if the person with the unmet needs is sprinkling broken glass along the path to meet those needs and saying, go ahead, try and meet them. I suppose some heroically helpful person could seek out and find the unmet needs hiding behind someone's silence, complaint, sarcasm, or hostility, and then meet those needs. But what are the chances of that miracle occurring? Pretty small. To meet a need, it helps to reveal the need to a friend or loved one with the clarity and transparency of a billboard. One can state out loud, I need to feel valued. One can add what it would do for them to feel valued. I would then feel happy and energetic. Understanding the valid need and the benefits of that need, the other would be interested in meeting that need to be valued. Then, how? 
So they brainstorm actions that would meet that need, seeking ideas both parties would feel good about. For instance, if you gave me a high five whenever I washed the dishes, I would feel valued. The other person might like the idea and agree to the high fives, but if they don't, they would do well to keep brainstorming. How about if I say thanks or good job when you do the dishes? Ideally, they agree and they have a plan they both like. Liking the plan, it is easily implemented. Plans they don't like, don't get implemented. As the plan succeeds, the first person's needs are met and they're happy. The second person knows they have succeeded, which also feels good. And then they can turn to that second person and consider their needs. When I roll into camp through a line of cheering campers, that meets my need for celebration. I didn't negotiate with 250 boys to cheer my arrival, but someone did. I can imagine the announcement. A bunch of crazy alums are riding their bikes across Massachusetts to camp. Let's cheer them in. The opportunity to go out and yell meets the kids' needs to be loud. Our fundraising meets the camp's need for support. I'm celebrated. Everyone's needs are met. We're all happy. Similarly, a family can meet its members' needs or not. I think there are four types of families going from miserable to happy. The worst or more, most miserable would be a family with no order, no rules, no structure, and then no truth on which to stand and no way to succeed. This type of family, the second type of family, improves upon this chaos with the arrival of a boss who imposes order. But then the family has a dictator. The third type is not ruled by a boss, but by implicit obligation. It does not need a boss because everyone knows what they have to do. Still, in this family, people are not free to do what they want. In the fourth and happiest family, the feelings and needs of each member are important and the members negotiate to meet those needs. So happiness comes when we think in constructive ways and when our needs are met. And yet, a person could be thinking healthily and having their needs met and still ask, so what? Someone asking, so what, is missing the meaning of it all. Meaning comes when we live with a purpose found when we act in accord with something that transcends ourselves and that we value. And values are matters people care about so deeply that caring is part of our identity. I am who I am because I care about blank. Living out our values and therefore our identity and supporting someone that transcends our individual interests gives our lives meaning. I value friendship and human development and support both by biking with my friends to support a camp that supports human development, making a bike ride meaningful. Many people value love and family, and so they marry and have children devoting themselves to something that transcends themselves, their children, makes life meaningful. Curious though, curiously though, bringing Junior into the family sometimes lowers parents' happiness. When it was just a couple, they could meet each other's needs 50-50. But when the child needs feeding at 4 a.m. and diaper changes and so forth, taking up 90% of the pie of needs, leaving 10% for the parents, their happiness can take a hit. With needs unmet, such as for sleep and other things, some parents do find their happiness down, meaning up. 
Fortunately, as Junior matures and becomes less dependent, the parents find more opportunity to negotiate for their needs. Besides all this psychology, spirituality also supports happiness and meaning. Spirituality offers helpful thoughts. I am loved. I am saved. I belong. The 14th century English mystic Julian of Norwich wrote at a time of plague, all will be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Spirituality offers such a helpful thought. Spirituality gives us a transcendent perspective. As people thrash around in the weeds of their lives, the spiritual view takes a pers perspective of the infinite, like an astronaut's view of the Earth. One such astronaut, Russell Schweikert, wrote, you look down there and you can't imagine how many bound borders and boundaries you cross, and you don't even see them. Hundreds of people in the Mideast killing each other over some imaginary line that you can't even see. And from where you see it, the thing is a whole, and it is so beautiful. You wish you could take one in each hand, one from each side of the various conflicts, and say, look, look at it from this perspective. As another example of a spiritual perspective, Job, afflicted and grieving, confronts Yahweh about his suffering. And Yahweh answers from a whirlwind, saying, gird up your loins now like a man. Hast thou an arm like God? Canst thou thunder with a voice like God? Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? And though Job's God makes no attempt to vindicate himself, still Job is satisfied. Indeed, Job glimpses the span of the universe from God's eye view, which satisfies his soul. And spirituality also meets needs. In a mystical experience, it meets one's needs for belonging. Emerson experiences belonging as the currents of universal beings circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. In a mystical moment, he realizes he belongs to the cosmos, which makes him glad. Rebecca Parker describes a spirit meeting a need for love. There is a love holding me. There is a love holding you. A love holding all. Our need for love is meant by an infinitely loving source. We do not have to earn it. We rest in this love. Spirit meets our need for sustenance. Its sustaining effect is apparent in the Latin origin of the word spirit, which is spiritus, meaning breath. Just as breath fills and sustains us, so spirit fills and sustains us. When filled with breath, our need for oxygen met, our bodies relax. When filled with spirit, our spiritual needs met, our hearts can be at peace. And spirit gives life meaning by connecting us to ultimate values such as for transcendence, or love, or peace. The Spirit reminds me of those values, and when I live by them, rewards me with meaning. Spirit also supports meaning by connecting us to that which transcends ourselves. Spirit brings me into relationship with my loved ones, with all of humanity, with all of life, with nature, and with the infinite. Connected to all, I find meaning.
Happiness is simple. Think well, meet your needs. Meaning is simple. Live by your values, transcend yourself. Simple, but not easy. For support I pray, O Spirit, when happiness and meaning seem elusive, lift my thoughts out of the weeds and into the perspective of the infinite. Breathe into me what I need to be alive and to love. Remind me of what I care about most and bring me close to my loved ones, to all people, to this lovely world, and to all that is. Amen. I'd like to conclude with a hymn about spiritual support. It's Every Time I Feel the Spirit, number 208. and Nelson and Robin for sharing, and all of you for sharing the service with me. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are, and renewed by their grace, move boldly into the universe. Amen.